All right, why don't we get started? I'd like to welcome everyone who's logged on to the uh, first of the yearly um, fellows webinars. Uh, we had the informational webinar in the summer, but this is the first topic webinar of the year. Uh, I know it's been busy with the fellows course on Thursday nights, but we had planned these webinars before that course and we wanted to push forward because we think that they're very worthwhile. Um, this, tonight's topic is degenerative spondylolisthesis. We're going to look at some a very common topic and try to dissect a little bit and, and get into the, into the weeds about how we treat these things. Um, my name is Daniel Gelb. Uh, I am a professor of orthopedics at the University of Maryland. Um, I am joined tonight by my partner and the uh, director of our fellowship program, Dr. Stephen Ludwig, who is also a professor, uh, and also assisting us tonight very capably are our three current fellows, Nina Lara, Peter Cohn, and Soheb Hashmi, uh, and they will be doing the, the lion's share of the work uh, tonight. Uh, just in terms of housekeeping, uh, these are the disclosures for each of us, um, and they've all been um, adjudicated before and shouldn't have any um, conflicts of interest for this particular session. So the learning objectives for this um, discussion should be to talk about the indications for fusion and degenerative spondylolisthesis, uh, to describe different surgical options, uh, for degenerative spondylolisthesis list common complications and to look at how degenerative spondylolisthesis may affect sagittal balance and how that changes our reconstructive strategies. Uh, and we'll do this through a series of case discussions. Uh, right now I'm gonna hand off the microphone to Sohab, to Dr. Hashmi, uh, who is going to present the first case. So, uh, Soheb, you take the microphone and do your thing. Uh, good evening, everyone. This uh, first case we'll talk about a 63-year-old female that presents to our clinic uh, for evaluation of one year of back pain. Uh, it's progressed uh, acutely over the past three months, and bilaterally, she does experience intermittent radiculopathy. The right lower extremity is worse than the left lower extremity. She also um, has had previous treatment with uh, current Motrin physical therapy formal regimen, as well as a surgical history of a L45 uh, hemilaminectomy in 2012, which did give her relief. Uh, however, had to have a revision procedure, um, same level, index uh, level L45 hemilaminectomy in 2018. Uh, past medical history, significant just for asthma GERD. She's a non-smoker and she is um, employed. Move on to this next slide. She uh, presents for evaluation with uh, these standing uh, lumbar spine uh, AP and lateral images, uh, which demonstrate L45 uh, grade one degenerative spondylolisthesis. She does have a very uh, small component of the uh, degenerative scoliosis as well. Uh, however, that is minor. So, Habe, I'm going to interrupt you for just one second just to add, um, because I know it wasn't in the chart. She was originally seen by telemedicine. She's a relatively recent pace since COVID started. Um, and uh, she has no fixed neurologic deficits in her lower extremities. She's, she's neuro I just want to add that she's neurologically intact. Right, yeah, that's a good point, especially in this era of a lot of telemedicine consults here. I guess the only other question I would add, ask Dan, since you know the patient the best, I think it's really important for people to understand after each of the microdiscectomies she had, did the patient get relief after each procedure? She got very good relief after her initial procedure in uh, 2012, but um, following her 2018 procedure, she did not really get significant relief. Go ahead, so. Uh, 
Uh, the, so we'll move on to her advanced imaging. Uh, a parasagittal um, image at the L4-5 level does demonstrate a previous right-sided hemilaminotomy uh, defect there, as well as post-surgical scar tissue. She does have um, instability with facet cyst, um, as well as facet signal in bilateral uh, facets. She does have a facet cyst that encroaches into the spinal uh, canal itself, uh, seen on the sagittal. And she does have end plate changes also degenerative in nature at the uh, L5-S1 level with uh, complete disc degeneration. Uh, another level, um, just caudal to that, um, sagittal and axial demonstrates uh, lower, she does not have significant central or uh, far lateral stenosis. And looking at her neuroforamen in, in these next two images, we can see that she does have moderate to severe compression of her L45 neuroforamen on the right, as well as on the left, which is less severe. And so our assessment of this patient, this is a patient with L4-5 degenerative spinal ascesis with right lateral recess stenosis and bilateral neuroforamen stenosis with a previous um, L4-5 hemilaminotomy as well as a revision procedure at that level. Right. So that, that's a great, uh, I think that's a great jumping off point for our, our discussion uh, tonight. So, you know, here's kind of a little bit more complicated, maybe not a primary, it's had, she's had previous surgery, but in general, uh, a low-grade uh, spondylolisthesis with fairly focal uh, nerve root compression. She doesn't have multiple levels involved. It's really kind of right at that level. Um, so the question becomes, you know, when is surgery app appropriate? Is surgery the most efficacious way to deal with this? Are there other things that can be done and if and when you get to a surgical procedure, what's the most appropriate surgical procedure? So, uh, and I think that's, you know, to start off, that's where we should start off is, 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 is this patient a, a candidate for surgery? And if you're going to do a surgical procedure, um, what is that? So, uh, so I'm going to, I'm going to pass it back to you uh, and I'm going to let you give us uh, a little bit of a literature review to tell us what's out there in the published literature uh, regarding uh, degenerative spondylolisthesis um, in regards to these types of questions. Thanks, Dr. Gail. We'll start with which surgical procedure may be most appropriate, I think, as a jumping off point there, and then we'll talk about uh, one step back, which is a non-surgical versus surgical options for these patients. In 2004, Kornblum and their group looked at 47 single level um, low grade degenerative spinal anesthesis patients uh, managed with either surgical management posterior decompression only versus bilateral posterior lateral arthrodesis. Uh, they did have excellent follow-up with seven years, eight months on average, uh, and they looked at clinical outcomes um, which they made in the form of a questionnaire. Uh, they did have um, the results show the solid fusion group without evidence of a pseudo, did better in terms of symptom severity and functional outcome at their endpoints. Um, and their conclusion was that a solid fusion, um, provided that uh, it succeeds, is a more superior uh, operative management for these patients compared to decompression alone. Next slide shows um, exactly um, what that questionnaire entailed. I think they did a good job of looking at symptom severity. I think that's important to tease out in these patients, whether it's um, axial or appendicular neurologic symptoms, and secondly, their physical function. Um, if we go to the next slide, I think the maybe larger question to address uh, firstly would be whether non-surgical options compared to surgical um, management of these patients is worthwhile. So the SPORT uh, database looked at a randomized 
304 patients um, and 97% uh, of patients at the end of the study did have surgical management, which is important to note uh, because they do treat these patients in their data analysis as both a, um, as intended and as treated, uh, which is important in our discussion of their results. But 33% uh, of these patients overall had a, a jump from the non-operative management crossover to operative management. And they did find um, importantly, you know, the disability index is higher in the decompression group. If we look at the as treated, the physical function is, is greater, is um, superior in the fusion group if we look at as treated. And also their bodily pain is improved if we looked at the as treated. However, those become non-significant or insignificant when we look at the as um, intended to treat. Uh, so although there, I think the biggest limitation of this study may be that there's very high crossover, um, but the data is still very meaningful when we look at the superior surgical outcomes compared to non-operative management of these patients. The um, Blumenthal group, um, not too long ago in 2013, published, um, I think, very interesting topic um, that a lot of people were really thinking about uh, whether to fuse or do a decompression alone is what may be the predictors of failure uh, for decompression only, which patients may have a secondary procedure, so looking at a prospective collection of uh, retrospective review, ultimately 40 patients um, that had a, a mild, a grade one degenerative spinal thesis. Uh, they had a mean follow-up of these patients 3.6 years. Um, and for decompression only, they found that 15 um, of the 40 patients, 37% had a repeat procedure for pain at that index level for instability. And for those patients, when they looked at um, multi-regression analysis, facet angle more than 50% on the MRI had a 39% risk of reoperation. A disc height of more than 5 point, I'm sorry, 6.5 millimeters had a 45% rate of reoperation. And motion at that segment associated with more than 1.25 millimeters, so very mild, associated with 54%. And combined, all three risk factors, 75%. Uh, reoperation rate. So I think uh, this maybe gave more knowledge into which um, patterns on a advanced imaging, uh, obviously static and not dynamic, but may give a sense of instability that exists in these patients. A uh, more recent article in the New England Journal. Uh, three years later after that one, looked at randomized uh, trial of 66 patients uh, with what they deemed a stable um, grade one degenerative um, spondylolisthesis had a laminectomy versus uh, laminectomy plus fusion procedure. They looked at clinical outcomes, both the uh, SF36 and a uh, disability index, and they did find um, that in these stable patients, actually the fusion group performed better in terms of physical function with the SF36 and also with the disability index, which I think also brings to a point, even stable patients uh, may have more improvement uh, compared to the uh, decompression alone. And the one point that is important to look at is table C, those are graph C on the, on the right. The risk of reoperation was far greater in the decompression loan group in, in this series as they followed them out over four years, uh, which was significant. And the final paper I, I believe we'll talk about here is um, the Swiss database that looked at uh, 247, a Swedish, sorry, database, 247 patients um, undergoing decompression versus decompression plus fusion. Um, 135 of these patients had lumbar stenosis in the presence of a degen spondy. Uh, they found actually that um, at two years, there was no 
difference in their disability between the two patient groups. Physical function, their uh, six minute walk test um, was no, no different than uh, either group. And the length of stay was um, greater as expected for the fusion group. Um, the costs were higher for the fusion group. And they reported in this series that there was really no difference in fusion um, versus decompression and reoperation rates. There were about 22% in the fusion versus 21% in this uh, series with a pretty good long-term follow-up. And so decompression uh, plus fusion had really similar outcomes at the end of their study, uh, both at two years and uh, final five-year follow-up. So this is this is the final study that uh, I think is worth uh, reviewing because uh, as we look at these, as the recent literature, there is literature out there to suggest that decompression is actually superior to fusion, um, not only equal. And this uh, recent study um, cohort of uh, 137 laminectomy alone patients evaluated at two years follow up. Um, only 33 uh, to 44 cases required technically proficient for MIST lift is what they said when they looked at um, a retrospective comparison cohort of fusion at that uh, same grade one Bigenera's Lysesis. So at five years, again, the laminectomy reoperation was only 10% versus fusion at 18.4%. So some would argue that technically a fusion performed inappropriately may have higher reoperation rates. I think this jumps into one of our questions. And Dr. Gelb is uh, going to be unmuted. We'll hear you. So I'm going to jump back in here. Sorry about that. I, I muted myself uh, inappropriately, um, but we'll go back. So let's go back into, into, into this. Um, so we have this 63 year old woman. Uh, she's got some high signal in the facet joints. Uh, can you guys see my arrow? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, here you can see she's got just this little low grade slip. Uh, very degenerate five one segment. She's got focal focal stenosis with a maybe a, a facet cyst or a ligamentum flavum cyst. Um, so let let me bring um, Dr. Ludwig into this uh, to give us some wisdom because I think that I think the literature on this stuff is, is pretty confusing. You know, you have there's certainly literature to suggest that. Um, maybe not in a revision situation, but let's call it, let's, let's, uh, let's assume it's a primary, um, that laminectomy alone may be um, uh, a procedure that can be done uh, effectively. Then we have other literature. I mean, I grew up, that first paper that, that Dr. Hashmi showed was really the culmination of the uh, Detroit Royal Oak, uh, Harry Herkowitz, Jeff Fishgrun studies that went over several years where they looked at laminectomy versus fusion. And we were all, as older surgeons, we were all very influenced in the orthopedic world by the sense that we should be fusing all of these. So Dr. Ludwig, you know, what's, what's your baseline, right? Say this is a primary case, low grade spondy with focal stenosis. Does, who, gets who, who gets fused? Who doesn't get, gets fused? Um, what, what are your, how do you, how do you take this apart? Yeah, thanks, Dan. I, I think, if we're going to subtract out that the patient had previous microdiscectomies or hemilaminotomies, I think if you look at a couple issues with this patient, one, is the patient healthy enough, right? Can she get through a surgical procedure, not selection, right? Does she have the right symptoms? Is she the appropriate candidate? I think that's all important before you know, before you bring somebody to the operating room, right? The decision to operate is so much more important. Um, than, than, than what you do. So I, I think <clears throat> this woman did well after her previous surgeries, right? She 
had two previous microdiscectomies on the right side. She's a teacher, she's a worker bee, she's not a narcotic abuser. She's a little big, right? She's a little large, her BMI may be on the higher side, but she did well after her initial surgical procedure. She underwent a second attempt to decompress that nerve. I get the idea to try and save a, a fusion, right? We all know that added, the addition of a fusion adds time, adds morbidity, adds risk, adds blood loss, adds potential other complications that we don't, all don't want to deal with. But yet you don't want to bring somebody back for a third time now revision procedure. So I think all of that goes into the decision making of what I'm going to do. To fuse or to not fuse, right? I think Dr. Gale brought that up. Um, I look at this patient. Um, she had a little laminotomy. I, I can't really tell whether or not they really took any of her facets, but her facets bilaterally are very worrisome to me, right? There's a lot of fluid in the facet joints, right? Which tells me there's a lot of slop in the system. She's got a very high disc space height, also putting her at risk if you did a decompression alone for concern of a, a, a greater instability pattern from developing it. She's got a facet cyst, right? Either it looks like it may be coming from the left side of facet joint at L4-5 or alternatively coming from some ligamentum flavum. I need some clarity on that on the axials, but on the sagittal, it looks as though it's coming from uh, the facet joint. I, I think the tropism of her facet plays a role as I think so had alluded to as well. These are relatively coronally based, but the fluid inside the facet joint is very concerning. So I think given the fact that she's a good surgical candidate, she's failed an excellent bout of conservative management. She's had two previous microdiscectomy procedures that, that, that have been done, and she has a, a facet cyst. Um, I think if my goals are to help her with her lower extremity radiculopathy and a component of her back pain and avoid any further iatrogenic destabilization and to prevent recurrence of the facet cyst, in my hands, this patient is getting a revision decompression and I would include a fusion, right? I would look at the flexion extension views. Um, that would play a role in my decision-making as well for fusion. So do you, so you routinely, do you do your, your flexion extension views standing, sitting, lying sideways? Um, you get them on every patient before surgery? Yep, so what? good question. I, I typically do them standing, right? I typically um, ask the patients to do, I do standing, flexion, extension, lateral views um, to try and uh, deconstruct a little bit more about what's going on, right? I think if we went back and we looked at good flexion extension views with the facet diastasis and the fluid, I would get a sense that there would be a greater degree of listhesis when you flex and extend. One of the, the questions that came up in the audience was that they did not see any evidence of listhesis on the MRI. And I would argue, if you look at the MRI scan, when the patient's laying down, the patient looks reduced, right? So I could see where the concern is. When you look at the upright x-rays, uh, there's a very low grade, maybe if you measured it, maybe three or four millimeters of a spondylolisthesis there. I'm not sure how much, if we go back to the flexure and extension views, how much of a dynamic component of this. So this patient's getting a fusion in my hands. They're a third time revision decompression, facet joint diastasis, big fat disc space. The tropism of the facet joints is not, is, is sort of in the intermediate point between sagittal and coronal, and they're healthy enough to get through a fusion. So, so, so Ted Choma is asking in, in the in the Q and A box, and I, I forgot to mention this. If if people have questions or want to or want to ask questions or comment, please type your questions into the chat box. Um, how much how much motion is too much motion? One millimeter, two millimeters, four millimeters. What 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 do you think is is significant? Yeah, yeah I think Ted, that is a great question. And to be honest with you, I have trouble just putting the little pointer when I'm doing the analysis, right? And, and doing that measurement, right? So I'm not even quite sure I am accurately measuring that instability. So it's somewhat of a gestalt. I think if we had an, a really truly accurate way 
of making the measurement, I would probably say, if you held a gun to my head, maybe two to four millimeters gets my concern sort of go up a bit. However, uh, if you have some hypermobility or a kyphotic angulation through the disc space, that's also a concern for me as well. Um, okay, so, and then I guess the last question uh, for you, Steve, that I have is um, your go-to in someone here, low grade, um, I assume you're only gonna, you know, she has pathology at one level, um, posterolateral, interbody, um, what's your, what's your go-to for this type of low-grade spondylolisthesis? Yeah, yeah, I, I think that's also, you know, there's no real equipoise or data, right? You can find data to support in situ fusion, instrumented fusion, inner body fusion, open, MIS, lateral, mass T-lift, uh, front back, A-lift, right? We're, they're all over the place, right? You can find supportive data. But what about you? Yep, it will work best in my hands, right? I think this is somebody that is a good fusion host, right? She's had previous hemilaminotomy windows, but the inner transverse process zone has never been touched. So in my hands, good fusion host, I think about time in the OR. I think about patient comorbidities. I think about their fusion host status. I think about previous surgeries. I think about every time I pass you know, across the nerve roots. If I'm doing an inner body, I'm putting that nerve root at risk, inner incidental derotomy, et cetera. I'm thinking about bone quality, right? So in this patient, this patient is getting a lumbar decompression, fusion, instrumentation, no inner body. Open. Open. Okay. So let's, now let's, what, that, now we know you're open, but let's get, let everybody, all the fellows have been doing this now for a couple of months and we have plenty of it, we have tendons on the thing. Let's do a little quick ARS. Uh, we have this, here's the woman, she's got, would you do continued non-surgical care? Is there anybody in the decompression alone group who uh, believes that laminectomies uh, can be done safely? Uh, decompression, posterolateral fusion, T-lift, or some type of anterior procedure, either an A-lift or a lateral plus or minus posterior instrumentation. Let's just take a quick ARS and see kind of where that group is, because I think we do have clinical equipoise. There so, are no so Dan, groups. just for clarification, the group is going to assume that this is not a virginal case. The patient had two previous microdiscectomies, correct? Yeah, yeah. We, we'll, we'll, we'll take the case as it is, but let's just see kind of what, what people want to do. Great. Mark, can you tell us if people are, are voting or not? I can't see it. Yep. Mark, it just looks like the question's still. I'm not getting yeah, the sorry, results. Uh, they're voting. I'm, okay. about to, I'm about to end it. Okay, thanks, Mark. So, looks like about 60% of people chose t -Lif. Um, there's still about 12% of people who will do just a, a revision, another revision Lamy, um, and about a quarter of people will do decompression and posterolateral fusion. Interesting. Very interesting. I think very, probably very consistent with national trends. I'll show you what we did. Um, we did a very simple, uh, uh Ludwig and I have been practicing in the same place in the same space for a long time. Uh, so a open, um, midline, wide laminectomy, um, facetectomy to, you know, foraminotomy and a posterolateral fusion. You can, I don't know if you can appreciate the bone graft out in the, in the gutters, but a very simple uh, procedure. Here's her post-operative standing films. Um, and she's, as I said, this is done during COVID. So a relatively, relatively recent case, but so far she's doing well. Uh, and is very pleased with her, her result. Um, and it's interesting when you look at um, a lot of the literature that So had brought up, right, with bone grafting, especially when you look at the sport trial, I think about a third of the sport trial 
um, patients had iliac crest autograft, right? Um, what are your thoughts on what do we need, still need to go to the crest, right, for a single level fusion? What, what are your thoughts on yeah, that? Yeah, I can't, I can't remember the last time I went to the crest. I'm, I'm pretty happy with um, the laminectomy bone. Clean, and we work really hard to, to, to harvest every bit of spinous process, lamina, facet, um, you know, grind it up, clean it up, grind it up, maybe supplement it with some allograft. Um, but I have completely stopped using iliac craft uh, autograft uh, for probably the last 15 years. Yeah, I would argue, is there any role for going to the iliac yeah. craft for a single yeah. level fusion in, right. a good, in, a good spo in a good host? in a virginal spine, right? Is there, right. Is there still a role right. for that? And, and, and I don't use BMP or any other osteobiologics, just, just bone. Anyway, let's, it, it, we're about halfway through the hour, so let's move on. Uh, I think, Peter, are you going to take over the presentation of the second case? Yes, sir. Okay, go for it. No, we'll get going. A um, little bit of a different flavor with this one. Uh, so this is a 74-year-old female um, coming in with low back and bilateral leg pain. Um, she's had chronic back pain, but it's gotten worse over the last three months. Uh, no trauma or inciting event. Uh, she did have some type of low back surgery about 45 years ago. Um, unsure what that was. Um, but at any rate, at this point, um, she has pain pretty much all the time. Nothing really makes it better or worse. Um, she does now need a walker to help her ambulate and is pretty much only going from her bed to a chair at this point. Uh, she notes that her posture is very forward. She's always leaning forward, she says, and she has mostly back pain, uh, but 25% of her pain is in her legs. She estimates um, that her left leg is worse than her right. Um, she doesn't have any paresthesias or weakness, um, and she's taking oxycodone for her pain control. Um, in terms of past medical history, relatively healthy for a 71-year-old, just hypertension, obesity, uh, high cholesterol. Um, and in terms of past surgery, I mentioned unknown low back surgery a while ago, and she's had an appendectomy and a total hip. On exam, she does stand decompensated forward. Um, she has a diffuse pain in her lumbar spine, particularly with range of motion. Um, she does have five out of five motors throughout her lower extremities with no sensory deficits and normal reflexes um, and no pathologic reflexes. And she is able to walk, but she is using a walker to get around. Um, so these were her initial standing uh, x-rays, uh, which we got in clinic. Um, and here you can uh, note a multi-level spinal thesis at 2, 3, and 3, 4. Um, and you can tell that, you know, just, I know this is only a lumbar view, but you can tell that she has some positive sagittal balance. Um, but overall, coronally, she's well aligned. And then I went ahead and just measured her pelvic incidence and her lumbar lordosis for uh, the purposes of the talk. Um, this is a little bit of an estimate, uh, but she's about 60 to 63 degrees uh, with her pelvic incidence, and really almost no lumbar lordosis, only 16 degrees from L1 to her sacrum. Uh, we also got an MRI for her, which is pictured here, mid-sagittal on the left, and there's a few select axial cuts at the, dicks, uh, at the disc spaces that we can go through as we go down. So at 1-2, she has uh, central stenosis. Um, at 2-3, more severe stenosis. At 3-4, also more severe stenosis. Four or five, she opens up a bit, but obviously still tight, particularly in that left lateral recess. And five one opens up a little more, but still lateral recess stenosis. And then there's some parasitical cuts just to show the foramen, which are relatively open bilaterally. And Ted Joma wants us to make note of the fact that. Um, she's got, you can see she's a, a larger lady and, and she actually has quite a bit of, uh, what's left of her canal has a, quite a bit of epidural lipomatosis, which I think is an excellent. Yes, uh, especially uh, notable at that one, two level. Yeah, very excellent point, Ted. Um, so again, here we have, you know, here, here's a different, different beat, you know, when I was in fellowship, 
uh, with Dr. Bridwell, he used to he used to say there are lots of dogs, but some dogs are poodles and some dogs are Dalmatians. So you know, it's, it's still in the in the category of degenerative spondylolisthesis, but really a completely different breed of uh, animal. Here we have not only we have multi-level stenosis, but we have multi-level um, so you have multi-level spondylolisthesis and a sagittal uh, balance problem. Um, so, you know, this becomes a different, a completely different issue. Um, so I asked Nina to go through some of the literature that she could find. And it's certainly not an, you know, the, the literature on sagittal balance is exhaustive, but we tried to focus a little bit on sagittal balance problems and degenerative spondylolisthesis. Um, so I asked, so Nina, are you going to pick up the, the talk at this point and, and just go through some of the literature that you found related to this? Sure, absolutely. If we can go to the next slide and then I can talk about some of the studies. Um, so this study here, double level degenerative spondylolisthesis, what is different in the sagittal plane by Ferraro et al. Um, this is a study out of Paris, France. It's a multi-center retrospective review of 78 patients. Uh, with multi-level or two-level uh, degenerative spondylolisthesis versus 576 patients with single-level degenerative spondylolisthesis. And the purpose of this study was to describe the demographic and radiographic um, differences between patients with multi-level compared to single-level degenerative spondylolis spondylolisthesis. And so they assessed uh, radiographic parameters, um, all the spinal pelvic parameters that we're familiar with, uh, but also use the C7 tilt um, angle to assess uh, sagittal or SVA. Um, we can go on to the next slide. Um, so here's uh, some of the data points or some of their measurements from their radiographic analysis. Um, and they found that C7 tilt was greater, was found to be greater in multi-level degenerative spondylolisthesis uh, compared to single level patients. Um, so, uh, the multi-level degenerative uh, spondylolisthesis patients um, had an increased SVA. Um, their pelvic tilt was significantly higher in the multi-level group, 26 degrees versus 22.6. And then as well as their ratio of pelvic tilt to pelvic incidence, 42 to 37 um, degrees. Um, so what they uh, were multi-level uh, patients had a higher pelvic incidence compared to the single level. They also had greater malalignment, they had increased SVA, they had less lumbar lordosis, which mainly occurred at the lumbosacral L4 S1 uh, junction. And so the findings of this uh, current study, um, again, highlighted the lack of lumbar lordosis in multi-level degenerative spondyl spondylolisthesis patients occurring at the critical lumbosacral area, um, which led to increased SVA. And so to compensate um, for this increased SVA, patients needed to recruit compensatory mechanisms such as pelvic retroversion, um, which was highlighted by the strong correlation between loss of lumbar lordosis and pelvic tilt. Um, and then moreover, these results, um, the correlation of, these, of the, these, uh, this analysis emphasized relationship between local kyphosis at the lysthetic level and pelvic retroversion, and also between the loss of L4-S1 lordosis and anterior C7 tilt angle or increased SVA. So bottom line is that they concluded that correction surgery, such as a Smith-Peterson osteotomy or a three-column osteotomy, may be discussed um, for patients who have multi-level degenerative spondylolisthesis. And that's just something that's important to recognize. Um, so next, next study. Um, uh, this study uh, is influence of postoperative sagittal balance and spinal pelvic parameters on the outcome of patients surgically treated for degenerative lumbar spondylolisthesis. Um, this included 84 patients, and it was just an ob observation study. Um, all patients undergoing surgical management of degenerative spondylolisthesis, they broke the groups up into two separate groups. Group one had an SVA of less than 50 millimeters. Group two had a postoperative SVA of greater than 50 millimeters. And in each cohort had patients that underwent uh, instrumented posterior lateral fusion alone or um, instrumented posterior inner body fusion. And so they compared um, postoperative SVAs. And so the purpose of the study was really to determine whether the postoperative SVA and spinal pelvic alignment, if this affects patient reported outcome measures after treatment. Uh, next uh, slide, please. 
uh, one back. Okay, um, so these table here, um, I know it's a lot of, it's a busy slide, um, but bottom line is that this study found that the overall lumbar lordosis, um, but, but if they're looking at the table um, to the right, the overall lumbar lordosis, but not the instrumentation angle was significantly different between cohorts um, of single level versus multi-level. Um, and again, this suggested that a much more extensive surgery may be necessary to account for the um, sagittal decompensation found in these multi-level degenerative spondylolisthesis patients. Um, and then also not shown here, um, they also found that the multi-level patients, um, uh, spondylolisthesis at the L3, L4 level, and then multiple levels that are treated with fusion were more common in patients that had an increased post-operative SVA greater than 50 millimeters. Um, so, you know, this study in accordance with previous deformity studies, um, this study has shown that patient-related outcomes um, influenced by overall postoperative sagittal balance defined by SVA um, is important in outcomes in, in achieving um, uh, uh, health-related quality of life improvements. Um, so again, uh, this is a, you know, it's, a, it's important to address SVA in patients with multi-level genetic spondylolisthesis. Um, next study, uh, the effect of uh, segmental lordosis on clinical outcomes of two-level posterior lumbar interbody fusion or two-level degenerative spondylolisthesis. Um, the purpose of this study was to investigate the clinical and radiographic outcomes after patients who had a two-level degenerative spondylolisthesis underwent a two-level PLIF, um, specifically at the levels L3, L4, L4, L5. Uh, and determine the relationship between spinal pelvic parameters and clinical outcome. Um, it's a retrospective study. They looked at 33 patients, um, divided the groups into a good outcome, which was 19 patients, or a poor outcome of 14 patients. And this was based off of uh, the Japanese Orthopedic Association scores um, at final follow-up, which was uh, on average about three years. Um, so, you know, their results, uh, they found significant changes in segmental lordosis and lumbar lordosis between the two groups. Lumbar lordosis was measured at the angle between um, sphere and plate of L1 and the sacral slope. And the change uh, was measured between the change of um, sphere and plate of, sorry, of L3 and inferior plate of L5. Um, they also found significant difference in SVA between the two groups. And we can actually um, jump to the next slide here so we can just kind of see this in numbers. Um, what's interesting about this study, if you look in table uh, one here, clinical outcomes and sagittal spinal pelvic parameters, you can see here that their patients preoperatively, their SVA was about 50 millimeters and at final follow-up about 90 um, uh, millimeters. And this was statistically significant um, pre-op versus uh, post-op. Um, and so, you know, what they concluded were clinical outcomes are satisfactory uh, for two-level PLIFs and two-level degenerative spondylolisthesis. However, the, the outcomes are still not as good compared to single-level fusion for degenerative spondylolisthesis, and then found that increased um, um, segmental lordosis may lead to better clinical outcomes after a two-level PLIF in multi-level degenerative spondylolisthesis. So again, um, in these multi-level patients, it's, it's critical to, ad to address the lack of lumbar lordosis and um, additional uh, spinal pelvic uh, uh, decompensation uh, measurements in order to uh, improve their SVA, which ultimately um, has been tied to improved uh, outcomes. Okay, thank thank you, Nina. Um, so we'll so I'll jump back in here and, and we'll do a little more uh, discussion. I, I remind everyone that if you have uh, comments, questions, um, use the Q&A box uh, to um, contribute if you'd like to. But let me go back to Steve Ludwig. So Steve, here's a, a woman who's got multi-level degenerative uh, spondylolisthesis, loss of lumbar lordosis, uh, very tight stenosis. Um, so, you know, tell me, in. We know the goals, right? We, I think Nina has gone over and showed us that the goal is if we can restore sagittal balance to something that's age appropriate um, and then get adequate decompression and a solid 
solid fusion. But the real question was, so what's, how do you get there? What's your, what's your, what's your strategy? How are you going to, how are you going to take this apart and, and, and figure out what you're going to do? Steve, are you muted? Sorry, I, I, sorry about that. I think they're clinical goals and they're radiographic goals that you have to think about that we should all think about. Um, her clinical goals, as you brought up, uh, she wants to get rid of her lower extremity radiculopathy, get rid of her neurogenic claudication. She wants to stand upright, right? She wants to get rid of a component of her back discomfort. This woman had surgery 45 years ago. It's really unclear what she had done, but she's 71. She's morbidly obese. You know, she's aged. I'm not quite sure what her frailty index is, but she has some medical comorbidities. I think if you think about that in the context of what your radiographic goals are, to Nina's point and to what Dr. Gelb is pointing out, right, we have to reestablish her sagittal plane alignment, right? in the context of her pelvic incidence and in the context of her age, right? Um, a PILL mismatch for somebody that is 40 years old compared to somebody that's 70 year old, seven years old, depending upon their pelvic incidence are two dramatically different points that you have to hit, right? And there's data points out there that I would refer you to look at in the literature. With that said, said there's a component of her sagittal plane imbalance that's probably related to pain. And I think Ted Choma brought this up in one of his points during the other case, right? This patient may be standing there because there's a component of this deformity or sagittal plane deformity that is fixed, right? There's a component of this that may be pain related in a compensatory motion for her severe stenosis. So I think with all that said, looking and comparing her upright weight-bearing x-ray on the right compared to what she looks like lying down on the table are two dramatically different pictures. I think the question is, how can we achieve those goals, get her in the context of hitting some of those parameters uh, and, um, and, and, and get a good outcome? With that said, I think for this person, you know, we decompress all those levels that are stenotic. For her, I believe she was stenotic at one, two, two, three, three, four, four, five, right? I think when you look at, um, you know, from an angularity standpoint, and Nina brought this up in one of the two articles she had quoted, getting her focal segmental uh, sagittal plane uh, improved, especially at the spondylolisthetic aesthetic levels for her, two, three, three, four, four, five, I would consider posterior column osteotomies in addition to potentially inner body support at those three levels and fusing those three uh, levels to help with the improvement of her sagittal plane. I would make those decisions after I began to deconstruct the spine in the operating room and add inner body support depending upon how much blood she was losing and how well she was doing and what it, lo what it looked like on the table after I did my bony cuts, my posterior column osteotomies, have my screws uh, in. I would once again add inner body support if it looked like she was still kyphotic and I still had a component of the deformity that needed to be corrected. Part of the correction is by positioning uh, the patient appropriately. It starts there. So I probably would decompress from the undersurface of one through five. I would save the supraspinous interspinous ligament at five one. I would do my posterior column osteotomies at the three, four, and five level. Um, potentially inner body support at all those levels, and I would be done. Okay, so there's a, there's a question in the box that I think is a great question, and, and someone's asking, how do you, you know, and we have this discussion every week, how do you know when somebody's leaning forward because they're very stenotic, and how do you know, and how do you know when it's just that they've got a fixed deformity? Yeah, that's a great question, and I think some of that, right, you need you know, to evaluate this patient, and I think we had it up in the initial discussion, you really need longstanding um, scoliosis uh, views to help with that. I mean, if you look at that, and you also look within the context of her MRI scan, um, and I alluded to this, right, there's a component of this that is compensatory, right? She, she corrects, if you measure her lumbar lordosis um, on the MRI scan and compare it to her lumbar lordosis, when she's weight-bearing and standing up, right? They're two dr 
they're going to be two different numbers, I would argue. Um, so I, I think there's a component of that. That's yeah, the this. other thing I think is a, is a good clue is that people who are leaning forward because they're stenotic don't retrovert their pelvis. So when you're forward and have a retroverted pelvis, I think that's more likely to be a fixed sagittal deformity. When you're leaning forward and just leaning forward and your pelvic tilt is not increased, that's either a hip flexion contracture or somebody who's leaning forward to get to, to take the pressure off their neural elements. Well, let me ask you one, we're, we're, we're getting a little late on time, but let me ask you one other question, Steve. What's, you know, T-lift, lateral, um, what's your go-to inner body uh, reconstruction for someone like this? Yeah, this is a painful case for me, right? I, I would do T-lifts, right, at, once again, two, three, three, four, four, five. And then when would you go to the pelvis? Um, I, would, I would decompress one to five. I would not fuse across. I don't believe she was stenotic at five one. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, so I would stop at five. I would not touch supraspinous, interspinous ligament at five one. I would do inner bodies at four, five, three, four, two, three, undercut one, two. And that would be it. She's 71 years old. If I went to the sacrum, I would be concerned about a long lever arm um, at S1. And depending upon her T score and her DEXA, uh, I would be concerned about with the deformity correction, with the stiff le uh, moment arm at the sacrum, breaking her sacrum, I would go to the pelvis if I fused to, to, to the sacrum. Okay, so. so doing an L2 to five decompression infusion is a lot different than doing a fusing every level and going to the pelvis for a 71 morbidly obese uh, patient with medical comorbidities. That's okay. I guess my point. Okay, so um, here let's do, we'll do another ARS. Uh, would you do decompression, posterior column work only, postlateral fusion? Uh, I think this is all right. If I go back, I, I think we're, she really needs decompression pi to L1. Uh, I think if, when we look at those films, but I put, when I did the questions earlier, I put two. Would you do decompression multi-level T-lifts, two to five? Uh, direct, would, would you do a trans direct lateral? release and then a posterior instrument did fusion two to five uh would you do two, two to the pelvis um with just posterior column work or would you do t t really go whole hog go t10 to the pelvis with an a lift at l5s1 to maximally uh restore sagittal plane profile in this woman let's all vote and see what we come up with uh, decompression and multi-level, it's a T-lift group. That's the second time T-lift has, uh, taken the, taken the, taken the prize, uh, but pretty, a pretty, a, a, a wider spread than last time, but it looks like people are going to do something kind of focal, just address the areas that are, uh, have the spondylolisthesis and try to restore in a focal, focal way. That's, that's, that's great. Um, I'll show you what we did. In this case, uh, I chose to uh, do a, I didn't go to T10, but as I said, she really needed decompression to one. Um, so we did one to uh, one to one, but we used pelvic screws to help uh, support the sacrum. And we did a, a T lift just at five one to, for inner body support uh, at the lumbosacral junction to prevent um, that from going on to pseudarthrosis. And uh, if you look here, we came, we didn't quite get the PILL mismatch perfect, um, but we came pretty close. And for someone uh, in her age range, not too bad. Um, if you look at her standing films, I think you can see that she probably still has an increased pelvic tilt uh, a little bit, but overall she's pretty well i mean at least at least her head or the or her sva is probably behind her hip joint uh which is what i'm always looking for in these older folks and um she's about 18 months uh from surgery and despite the fact that um she's not she didn't get a perfect uh pil mismatch um she's taken only mobic um she's off her narcotics uh, and she's quite pleased with her result and and you can see if you look at her most recent films
I don't know if you can read this, but she, she has lost, we did just post her column osteotomies, no inner body work and except for the very bottom. She has lost a little bit of her correction. She settled a little bit, uh, but despite settling uh, a little bit, she's, she's, again, she's quite pleased with um, the results. So I think that is the whole, uh, what we have to present tonight. These are the references um, that were presented. And if anybody wants this list, uh, I think most of these papers are probably in the fellows uh, handbook. Um, but if you are interested in this list, certainly you can contact uh, me by email and I'd be happy to, to get it to you. Steve, do you have any final comments um, in regard to what we've talked about tonight? No, I think there were very two different cases that illustrate a lot of different points in, that need to go through everybody's mind in the decision making. I think just the last thing, especially when you're dealing with somebody like the last case that's 71 years old, he has a multi-level deformity slash degenerative stenosis problem. Um, getting DEXAs on the patient and understanding their preoperative bone density is often important, you know, in your decision making, you know, implant choice, whether or not you want to try some, uh, uh, bone, uh, some medic medicinal management of their osteoporosis to try, especially if you're going big like you did on that last case. So that's just just one last thing to, for people to think about. So we are right at nine o'clock, it's 8.59. So we've used up our hours. Uh, if anybody has any other questions, they can put them in the, in the question box. There will be a series of uh, questions for you to answer for us, please. Some evaluation questions so that we can get some feedback on uh, the webinar. And I think Mark is gonna put those up for us. I don't, and so if you could, if the, we, the, we can't answer them as the hosts, but the, but the, um, but if you guys could all go through these questions and answer them for us, that would be very, very helpful. So thank you very much for uh, joining us uh, this evening. I think it was a great session. I I enjoyed the uh, discussion, uh, and I hope everybody has a good night. Thank you, Dan.